Mabuza venue. Being hosted in this particular venue gives one a warm and fuzzy feeling because here is where we get beautiful conversation going, engaging conversations, and one leaves the site very enlightened and knowledgeable. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the OR Tambo School of Leadership public lecture titled A Negotiated Settlement. Did the ANC sell out or sell out the dream or advance it? Before we proceed further, I would also like to acknowledge being hosted in this particular venue. Apologies uh, for that. Uh, I'm too small as we have a bit. We moved a little bit to the next, sometimes we have this, but we're back on. I wanted to acknowledge the FPS uh, for hosting us here, yeah. and also acknowledge distinguished guests who have joined us. We have in our midst our board member. Welcome. I also like to acknowledge a delegation from Swaziland Youth Congress led by Sakile. Additionally, I'd like to welcome and acknowledge South African Youth Council President Olile Doliga. Before I proceed, Continue. I'd like to take a few minutes to just go through the house rules. This is the part where I get to feel like a safety officer on a flight, a cabin crew, where I let everybody know where the toilets are. You walk up here, you go to the right, the male and the female toilets are on the right. And tonight, we have not scheduled any fire drill. If you hear any alarm, Fire alarm, you need to step out. We go down to the parking bay and we gather there. And also know that it's a safe space. Ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome. The lecture for tonight is hosted and delivered by Kada Palo Jordan, who will be joining us online. 
immediately afterwards, he will be responded by Jada with Maharaj. Before that happens, though, Jada Masondo or Principal will unpack. everybody but to thank you for being here and my task is simply to um, explain what the World Campbell School of Leadership is, what we do, why we do what we do and how we do it and I want to do it in two minutes because really today's purpose is to listen to uh, our veterans here who have uh, lived experience of struggle, including the topic that we're discussing about. They didn't learn it from books, but from the concrete experience. So the book that they've published, which uh, is titled Breakthrough, the Secrets <laughs> and, 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 and I think they will talk more about it uh, as a teaser and they'll give you a proper title. So, um, and part of the reason why we feel that we should pick up on this topic as part and parcel of the public lectures that we conduct as our Campbell School of Leadership, we do feel that this book is not really read widely, but uh, some of us, who have an armchair critique of what actually happened in 1994, in the early 90s, late 90s. We don't really appreciate the, uh, what you taught us, the objective factors and the subjective factors that led to the settlement that we basically had. So what is the school? The school um, is responsible for public political education. It has different target groups, like the public, if you're interested in the courses and the work that we do, you are more than welcome to enroll for our courses, which I'll talk about them just now. Um, we have a board, uh, which is chaired by uh, the former president, Halima Mouklati. Uh, we've got management, it as the principal and uh, all because Stephen was asking me what do you want here uh, and I said we've got a board uh, which take decisions which guides the work and the role uh, of management in this regard so it is a board that is responsible for the overseeing of management we're a non-profit uh, company uh, governed by different laws of this country, which they fought for for their own establishment. What do we do? Uh, we offer political education, as I said, and uh, we've got different programs uh, around which we deliver political education. Uh, one program is what we call strategic courses, uh, we've been mandated by the board to establish, to put together 13 courses, uh, which we call them strategic courses, and they range from gender, women emancipation, South African constitution, the position of Africa in the global economy, uh, the history of South Africa, uh, this uh, introduction to economics, is, we've managed to, establish, to put together 
eight of them. So that is one program that we uh, seek to deliver to different uh, audiences. And of course, our mission, our vision, as they indicate there, it's, um, oh, it's not written there, we oh, there were developing leaders for social change, but our vision is to help ourselves as South Africa to understand the world in order to change it. So that program, those courses, which are quite important, and the way we've developed them, we can develop our veterans in terms of the content, is what we said, is that we need to have structured, this knowledge must be organized uh, for better facilitation amongst different target groups. So the way we develop these courses, we uh, have subject experts who look at the content, and we had Saeed, which was responsible for technically writing the courses. Uh, and I always joke with some of my veterans who are over in Ireland that you guys, you had the whole day to debate politics because you were in prison, but under these conditions, we need to find ways of organizing this knowledge and to deliver it in a much more, and I'm not saying it was not uh, structured, I mean, uh, in a particular way, you don't remember that all the time, but we said under the circumstances, we need to put the courses that are properly organized, people are busy, and it's important therefore to put courses in <coughs> such a manner that uh, they enable people to be much more uh, systematic within the time constraints that we basically have. So, it's 18 modules, some of them have already delivered. And another pillar of our curriculum is around policy education, which ranges from economic policy, health policy, and so on and so on. And the way we teach these policies, when we economic policy, we don't simply say, this is what the ruling party or that party's uh, economic policy is. We say, what are the ideological and theoretical assumptions around certain policies and we tease that out and say this is how people come to <coughs> concluding the yeah or adopting certain policies they are not ideologically neutral they are not theoretically neutral they may not always say okay this policy is informed by this theory by this ideology but we tease those things out but to enable public representative and different audience that we target uh, to understand what are the underpinning uh, uh, assumptions, ideological and theoretical assumptions of each policy. The third area of our curriculum is around organizational skills, uh, how to write minutes, things that we take for granted, uh, how to resolve conflicts, because political conflicts can't always be resolved through courts, or courts need to give given space to deal with issues that our people are facing, so how to resolve conflict, how to write minutes, how to organize, how to run campaigns, not just elections, but uh, community issues and so on. So that's what the school program is all about. So these public lectures are just one of the programs that we run. We invite anyone to discuss anything under the sun without being told by anyone what we should discuss, because this is a platform for critical thinking, for critical reflection, for debate and discussions. So uh, we've been running these uh, public lectures for, uh, for years now, since we were established, even during COVID, we run them virtually. Uh, so this public lecture is just one of the lectures that we've been running uh, as a school. So I hope not go beyond the three minutes. Uh, if I have, may I duly apologize. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie Amasondo, always the educator. When he gets the platform, he takes his time to educate and to lead. Before we begin, I'd like us to all stand and take the national anthem to usher in our presenter, Kida Palopoki.
Are you able to hear us? Why are we still waiting for him? Okay, well, I don't think it's okay. Sorry, he did on mute. It's just his uh, video. Just Uh, good evening, comrades and friends. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Uncle Paolo. Right. Go ahead. So I'll proceed then. I want to approach this tonight more as a dialogue amongst comrades rather than as a lecture, because I think uh, we begin with a rather odd question. And it's been said that if you ask the wrong question, you can come up with the wrong conclusions. But I understand why the question has been raised. Yes, Uncle Paolo, we can hear you. Go ahead. It is a wrong question. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. There are a couple of narratives about our transition that have taken root as a result of the analysis of a number of people, there is the one narrative, which I would refer to as the narrative deriving from the apartheid apologists. Uh, it goes something like this, that uh, the National Party is wrestling with the issue of South Africa's constitutional dispensation 
And that during the process of wrestling with those issues, came to the conclusion that the only solution was a negotiated settlement. That's the one narrative uh, in which then uh, it would appear or the propagators of that narrative would like us to believe. Uncle Palo, Uncle Palo um, can, you, can you please interrupt you for a while? Uh, thank you, Uncle Palo. I think you can go ahead. Right. I was saying then that uh, the first narrative, which I characterize as the narrative from the apartheid apologists, suggests that the initiative for change came from the National Party in its search for a viable solution to the problems the country was facing. There is a second narrative, which I think is equally erroneous. Uh, this is the one which is beloved, especially by uh, commentators from abroad, uh, the miracle narrative that uh, in South Africa, you had this fortunate set of circumstances in which uh, a person who had been in prison for 28 years uh, with no bitterness came out of prison and found an interlocutor in an old Nationalist Party politician who had long last seen the light. And because there was this interesting chemistry between these two uh, people. Sorry, Uncle Palo, can, can you please pause a bit? Uh, uh, Kalpalo, I really apologize. We just had some technical glitches, but I think you can go ahead now. <laughs> And I'm saying uh, the second narrative is that because of the chemistry between these two persons, uh, there was this miracle 
which resulted in the avoidance of a very bloody civil confrontation. And you had a the third uh, suggests that uh, because the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, it created an environment in which the white minority lost its fear of the spirit of communism, thus opened up the doors of the negotiated settlement. Uh, there is a narrative which I think uh, has inspired the question around today's discussion. And regrettably, finding traction in the movement. And this is the narrative that uh, the ANC was outmaneuvered in the negotiations, or it sold out. And our constitution is emblematic of that. I'm taking issue with all the narratives because I think they are all wrong. And in one signification of the transition, I think it's clear why these narratives are all wrong. I think we have to start by within a historic time frame. And that time frame commencing in the 1970s and culminating with the collapse of the apartheid regime in the 1990s. It's a time frame during which one can say power in the Southern African region nope. visibly changed hands from the oppressors to the oppressed. Yes, and this was a time frame during which the National Liberation Movement under the leadership of the ANC was able to galvanize and marshal the forces necessary so, uh, to move about the circumstances that compelled the National Party to enter into negotiations. To understand what one is talking about here, it's necessary to refer to the ANC's strategy and tactics. And the ANC's strategy and tactics, we must never understand as something static, as uh, something akin to the Bible or the Ten Commandments. Strategy and tactics evolve in space and time and consequently are always under review, are always subject to alteration, to change, revision, and revisiting. However, after 1969 and the ANC's Morogoro Conference in Tanzania, the movement adopted a strategy arising from the suppression and repression of the liberation movement inside the country that came about after the Rivonia arrests. That ANC strategy and tactics derived from a particular moment in time. The organization, the structures, the personnel of the National Liberation Movement inside South Africa had either been completely repressed, dismantled, or dispersed. And it was necessary if we were going to move forward that those structures be reconstructed. So uh, the ANC strategy and tactics was aimed primarily at reinvigorating a movement that had been repressed. The first element of our strategy and tactics was the reconstruction 
of the underground, the rebuilding of the movement inside the country. It was our view that having reconstructed an underground structure inside the country, the movement will then acquire the capacity to organize centers of resistance to the racist regime and mobilize the people into mass action. This it was our view would create an environment in which it would be possible to conduct an armed struggle based on support from the people. <clears throat> the third element of our strategy and tactics was the armed struggle itself. And I think it's important to understand the armed struggle in the terms in which the ANC saw it and understood it. And to assist us in that, I'm going to quote from one of the ANC's important strategy and tactics documents, known as the Green Book, uh, adopted in the early 1980s. <clears throat> and in that Green Book, we say, and I quote, the armed struggle must be based on and grow out of mass political support. And it must eventually involve all our people. All military activities must at every stage be guided by and determined by the need to generate political mobilization, organization, and resistance with the aim of progressively weakening the enemy's grip on the reins of political, economic, social, and military power, and by a combination of political and military action. End quote. So we must understand the armed struggle in those terms. The Green Book then also goes on to say, to keep the perspective of a people's revolutionary violence as the ultimate weapon for the seizure of power and to concentrate on armed propaganda actions whose immediate purpose is to support and stimulate political activity and organization rather than to hit at the enemy." Close quote. So we must always understand then these dimensions of the strategy and tactics underground mobilization, mass mobilization, armed struggle as interconnected and intermeshed. The last element of our strategy and tactics was international mobilization, whose purpose was to isolate the racist regime while mobilizing support for the forces of national liberation in the international community. These four elements as I say, must be seen as interlocking and intermeshing and mutually reinforcing. The relationship amongst them, of course, changes and political practice on the part of the national liberation movement itself and the viability of its strategy is tested in the actual heat of the struggle itself. So as we move forward, we learn, we revisit, we revise, we rethink. <clears throat> the most important element, I would say, of the 20-year time frame I'm talking about with reference to South Africa, was the revival of the mass movement inside the country. This begins more or less imperceptibly in the early 70s with wildcat strikes amongst African workers in the Durban Pine Town area of KZN today. And that gives rise to the emergence of a trade union movement and the revival of the trade union movement. There is also a regional dimension, 
which we must not forget. The region is also undergoing very radical change during this time frame. There's the collapse of Portuguese colonialism in Africa, 1975. And as a result of that, the increasing isolation of the racist regime. The collapse of, Portu of Portuguese colonialism also opens up a new front of international solidarity, which one can deal with some other time. But it creates a situation in which the military capacity of the National Liberation Movement is greatly enhanced. It also creates a situation in which the armed forces of the Socialist Republic of Cuba uh, are also active in our region. As part of that regional transformation that's taking place, and in part in response to it, we have here at home the pro free Limo rallies, 1975, and then 1976, the urban uprisings detonated by pupils in our high schools opposing the imposition of Afrikaans. And that unleashes a whole new phase of our national liberation struggle, creating and deepening the isolation and the crisis of the racist regime. The response of the African National Congress to these events was that we should increase pressure on all fronts. The ANC was integrally involved in the setting up of what later became known as the Informal Association of Frontline States. And one recalls the first meeting of the Frontline States in Luanda, Angola, during May of 1977, after which President Oliver Tambo announced that the national liberation movements in the region were also constituting their own front line, which meant increased cooperation amongst those national liberation movements that were still engaged in armed struggle, namely the Zimbabweans, the South Africans, and the Namibians. We see the one major step forward and outcome of that front line of national liberation movements in 1980 with the collapse of the Smith regime and Zimbabwean independence. We can then see at that point that what we refer to as power passing from the oppressors to the oppressed, becoming more and more visible within the all of Southern Africa. The opportunities, the changes in the region created for the National Liberation Movement were unprecedented. The uprisings in 1976, and we must underline that the uprisings in 1976 signaled the crisis of total legitimacy or a total crisis of legitimacy for the racist regime. It had lost legitimacy amongst the oppressed as a result of the repressions of the 1950s and the early 60s. But after the massacres of 76, its legitimacy, its legitimacy even amongst its allies declined very radically. This was compounded by the murder of Steve Biko, 1978, 
resulting in the passage and through the Security Council of the arms embargo on South Africa. Prior to this, the Western governments led by Britain and the United States had successfully been able to oppose the imposition of arms embargo on South Africa. But after the murder of Miko, that became impossible even for them. So one can see there is a growing crisis which is engulfing the racist regime at this particular point in time. The other great opportunity which the events of this 20 year period created for the National Liberation Movement was in terms of the renewal of its personnel. Most of the comrades who were in the structures and who were the personnel in MK, in the structures of the movement, in exile, in the frontline states, Botswana, Swaziland, Lesotho, <clears throat> were comrades who had left the country during the 1960s. All of them were at least some 15 years older. 1976 meant that there was a renewal of the personnel of the movement with an influx of new recruits arising from the uprising in 76. It also created an environment in which the reconstruction of the movement and its structures inside the country could be speeded up and was accelerated so that one can, by the 1980s, begin to speak about a reconstructed underground liberation movement inside South Africa, which is able to service units of MK and is also able to conduct a whole host of propaganda and other activities. It was then as a result of the changes that had taken place during that second half of the 1970s, that during the 1980s, one can begin to see the convergence of all those forces who were in earnest opposition to the apartheid regime, beginning to converge around the ANC and its program. One recalls the publication of a small pamphlet called the Freedom Charter during the 1980s, because let's remember, the Freedom Charter was never an illegal organization and could be distributed inside the country. And it is during this time too, that we see the emergence of the United Democratic Front bringing together a coalition of forces opposed to racism around a common program. And that common program by the end of the 1980s is the Freedom Charter. We see also the emergence of COSATU as the leading trade union confederation, which also adopts the Freedom Charter as its program. The rejection of the tricameral parliament in the mid 1980s leads to a period of urban upheaval unprecedented in South African history. And we see during this period, the emergence of the, one might say, green shoots of centers of popular political power in the shape of street committees and other structures. And all this is happening in the context in which the region is undergoing a very, very rapid and visible change. There is, as a result, a crisis of confidence 
amongst the regime's supporters. And we begin seeing the beginnings of dissent, especially amongst the Africana intellectual elite who had in the past been the ones who prepared, hatched, and baked the harebrained schemes of the apartheid regime. There was a revolt amongst them because they could begin, they began to realize and recognize that the path that they had chosen was leading to disaster. There was, as a result, also a constitutional debate which was taking place inside the country. And a whole range of proposals were on the table. Initially, the response of the democratic forces inside the country was to be very skeptical. And one doesn't blame them because uh, many of these initiatives came from dubious sources. There was in the mid 1980s, for example, what something known as the Butelesi Commission sponsored by the late Prince uh, Mangosuta Butelez and his supporters. There were other initiatives. There were proposals about a Bill of Rights. And the initial response of the democratic movement, as I say, was skepticism. It was in the context of that that the ANC made an important intervention the constitutional guidelines, which we published in 1986 after the 1985 Kabwe Conference of the ANC. The Kabwe Conference of the ANC takes place in the context of the uprisings that were shaking the foundations of the apartheid regime during the mid 1980s. The ANC had called upon the people to make the country ungovernable, and it had become ungovernable. The slogan under which we came to conference in 1985 was from the conference for to the battlefield, and that was the mood. However, <clears throat> there was another dimension to the struggle which one should never lose sight of. The ANC had always held before the people of South Africa a vision of a future. And that vision of that future was the 10 clauses of the Freedom Charter. <clears throat> it was our argument that the Freedom Charter served as a sound basis for a new constitution for the country. The ANC had also avoided the strategic error of painting itself into a corner when the armed struggle commenced by announcing in the very documents that announced the arrival of uh, MK that if the regime was prepared to discuss a future of South Africa in earnest, the ANC would cease all armed activity. So we were in that position where we had very, very solid constitutional proposals in the form of guidelines. We had a strategy and tactics which was unfolding and yielding the sorts of results we wanted. And the racist regime was increasingly isolated internationally. And by 1989, we could see uh, that it was at the end of its days. The international campaign especially, especially resulted in the banks refusing to turn over those loans. That put the regime in crisis compelling it to negotiate. Now, given all that context, which one has talked about, one then has to talk about the constitution itself. The regime did not 
negotiate as some claim or some would have us believe because it was searching for a solution. There is negotiations didn't come about because of some special chemistry between Mandela and de Klerk. In all the investigations one has done, there is not a single hint that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a factor in the thinking of the Nationalist Party and its supporters when they decided that it was time for them to go to the negotiation table. And then this narrative about the ANC selling out, I think has to be weighed against what the outcome was. We arrive at 1990 at a point where the racist regime recognizes it can no longer govern in the old way. It has to change. The release of political prisoners in 89 and then the release of Nelson Mandela in 1990 are the concrete signals of that. We then go into constitutional negotiations. And yeah, one has to mention that they were very, very brilliantly handled by the ANC. We went into the constitutional negotiations in a context in which there were a number of constitutional designs before us. There was what was known then as consociationism. Uh, consociationism, I suppose, is a form of federalism. The consociations also argue that federalism is a form of consociationism. And the idea of consociationism was that the country constituted racially determined blocks, Africans, whites, colors, Asians, and that the way forward was to create a consociation of these racially determined blocks, each of which will have the same political rights, but as racial blocks, they would have mutual vetoes. In other words, if the colors felt that a decision of government didn't favor them, they'd have a right to veto it. The, the Africans could do likewise, the whites could do likewise, etc., etc., etc. This was more or less, more or less in one form or another, the proposals that were placed before CODESA by the National Party, by the then Democratic Party, by the IFP, by a host of other smaller political entities. The idea was that the country would be governed as racially determined blocks with a mutual veto. In opposition to that, the ANC came with constitutional proposals based on the Freedom Charter. One person, one vote within a unitary state. And it's important to understand that our negotiation process went through two phases, if you like. There were the debates, discussions at CODESA, which result in that interim constitution under which the 1994 democratic elections were held. And then there was the Constitutional Assembly after the 1994 elections, which bring, gives us the 1996 constitution, which is the one we have today. Apart from the principles of the Freedom Charter, which we have been able to carry into the 1996 constitution, one must understand that that constitution was crafted as an 
instrument of transformation and as an instrument for change. How we have used it as an instrument of transformation and change is another matter. And that can be discussed. But that is what is important to understand about our transition. Now to return to the question, if it betrayed during that negotiation process, I will listen. But unless one can demonstrate that, I think that allegation is just fragrant nonsense. The other related charge is that our constitution does not assist in the transformation of the country. Well, that is a matter which we can discuss and debate. But it's important with respect to our constitution to underline this, that no one ever suggested it was a perfect document. And that 1996 constitution has been amended a number of times already. All constitutions, beginning with the first written constitution, are eminently, eminently eligible for amendment, change, and transformation. So too is our constitution. If there are elements of it which are faulty, those can be attended to. But the principles and the basic premises on which our constitution is based, I think you'll find are rooted in the Freedom Charter and in the practice of the National Liberation Movement. Thank you. The medium of measure for the research and the science is the field of the one that you the and the and the and I
and also get responses and questions from um, our online audience as well. Yes, this is your time to ask and interrogate the lecture. Yes. Please tell us who you are and what's your comment. You can stand up and use your short steward voice, please. If I have one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And let me first appreciate the presentation that was done by Kumbra Kalu. And perhaps it's necessary to give us that story. I have one question though, and it emanates from the fact that there has been a great deal of confusion. And uh, we know the developments that have occurred in Parliament around the, the property code, uh, section 25 of the Constitution. There is a problem in the interpretation there, of which to a certain extent also address a necessity for the amendment of the clause so to enable the expropriation of land uh, without compensation. I want to uh, align myself with the uh, thesis that Comrade Palo uh, has accepted here in this meeting, but I need him to clarify uh, that confusion that is brought about uh, by the issues around uh, section 25, just to say whether was it properly crafted, does it achieve the intention and in the spirit of a transformative uh, constitution that we have spoken about, or the some which is and whether uh, the, the problem that we're having lies with our implementation and the interpretation uh, of the constitution. Thank you. There's a hand on the side. <coughs> oh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the mic is not working just yet. It was. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And this video. And uh, the point that I just want to raise uh, in relation to the presentation is I think farming has like a number of things. We do agree in the context of the that uh, the ANC is in the struggle and utilization to the uh, democratic breakthrough in 1994. But sometimes I think what we get interested from the national to talk about it's beyond the issue of memory. Uh, it's for us to uh, actually question the dream. What was the dream? What was the dream all about? Because I think the topic of today is the question of whether the ANC said the dream or not. So, what was the dream? And how far are we with the dream? And how well is the ANC? Carrying the dream forward today as a government part. I think uh, that is what our veterans have to talk about. You know, how is uh, the state uh, led by the ANC uh, uh, bridging or uh, uh, destroying the foundations that were created by the American government? Like we have to look into those things. I think one of them, and uh, there's, there's something that we talk about normally, you say that. Uh, we have in this country uh, two nations in one state. And I think that 
is a result of the apartheid regime. So now we have to talk about how far are we as a government in terms of uh, in terms of uh, 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 dealing with that problem. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, with the other hand, uh, this is our opportunity to engage with the topic. This is a topic of interest. And as um, Kumit Kano said, we hear different things from a different side. The dream is lost, the NC has sold out, and another school of thought is that now we are on top. So it's a debate that's ongoing. And this is the platform that we get as an opportunity to respond and ask and question. Can we achieve it? Good evening, comrades. I suppose it's a, it's a question both to Comrade Paolo and Comrade Mag. Um, and, as, and it relates to the question raised about the dream. Uh, when we entered the elections and our the um, message in 1994 was a better life for all. It was based on a program which was the reconstruction and development program. Um, and, you know, two years later, we had here um, and the introduction of, 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 of that policy, which was seen as overtaking the reconstruction and development policy, particularly in the economic sphere. And I think that if one look at the, the debate since the, I don't know whether it's the Stellenbosch conference or the one 2012, about um, that the first decades or the first two decades of freedom, we made advances in terms of social transformation, but economic transformation, there has certainly been an issue. Um, so I think that, that part of the problem about that dream that, that the comrade referred to has, has, has got to do with issues around state capacity and corruption. It has got to do with, with um, the issues around um, economic transformation. Um, because already in 20, 2004, when we were looking at the 10-year review, the 10-year review concluded that unless we move with economic transformation, the social the uh, uh, progress that we made in all of these areas, housing, water, et cetera, et cetera, will begin to be um, you know, challenged if we don't transform the economy. And in a sense, we, we, we over the last couple of years, we're at that point. Um, and so my, my question is, it's not so much because I think that the constitution, you're right, it provides a framework for transformation. It pro provides us with first generation rights, it provides us with second generation rights, it provides for redress. So the problem is not so much with the constitution, but I think that um, as Kumri Palo said, what we then did with that beachhead um, of transformation. And I think that, that the, the, the particular issue of, of economic transformation, what, what were the things that went wrong in that process, if, if anything? Um, and my view is that, that in fact, Part of the, the, the challenge that we face moving forward is exactly how do we ensure that we, that we address the two nations issue. And, and, and the only way that you can do that is by um, you know, strengthening the social aspects of our programs, but fundamentally transforming the, the economy. Thanks a lot, Chair. Thank you, Comrade Phoebe. That's where you are, and this is the mic. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Rudolf Shigwe from Deep Slot. And as a young person growing up in this era, I would say that uh, the, the, the dream was sold out. I would like to quote uh, something from Owar Tambo, which says, what I fear is uh, the liberators emerge as elite who drive around in Mercedes Benz and use the resources of this country to live in places and to gather riches. And I uh, stand to be corrected. That's this anime. Yeah. So that's a big reflection for me in terms of uh, what uh, the dream is for us. We 
we feel like the constitution is a luxury for certain individuals who are into power. But for us, some of us who are in township are left to fend for ourselves, we are struggling and without any chance of maybe, you know, testing or seeing the, 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 free, uh, the, 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 the dream that uh, is being discussed today. For most of us, it's not a dream, it's a nightmare that we are living. We are yet to see the dream as young people living in a constitute, uh, constitutional and democratic South Africa that we believe that our leaders had fought for, but we are yet to still realize the dream. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next question or comment, reflection? Okay. You can stand up. Okay. All of us, I think, are going to have around the same issue. Because, I mean, if you look in the hindsight, there's one thing that we'd want to ask our, our, our In a way of uh, what's happening now, going into fiscal austerity that the state didn't want to uh, spend, we need to collect the finance uh, to make sure that the finance are managed. But we're in a transition where we, we're transforming society, and the black majority, uh, the state have to have to uh, finance the integration into the main economy. Remember, in the early nineties, one of the key issues. And when we talk about the RPP houses, that was supposed to be a temporary thing that happens for the first four, for the first five years of accommodating some of the excess uh, people in the urban areas. But uh, and, and we argued uh, at that time some of us were of uh, in the that this is going to perpetuate uh, the status quo. It's not going to correct it. And we 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 find ourselves thirty years down the line. The same thing. Uh, the special uh, design of South Africa is not changed. It's still the same. It remains actually worse for, for the marginalized. I mean, coming from Kadro, I saw development going towards Ireland. Uh, transportation was not, uh, was not part of it. Schooling, recreational facilities were not part of it. The issue of crime and all this. This is what's happened. And I don't think we complain about, about now, because when we say in the ANC, we did look at it. I don't think the word selling out is really an appropriate thing. But how do we come to agree uh, into that dispensation without the issue of funding? And it, it's, it's quite amazing because the agreement uh, and the community <coughs> like here will tell us how different it will be uh, compared to the Lancaster agreement. Lancaster at least is better because the funding issue was, was on the table. The British and the Americans were going to fund acquisition of land by uh, the black majority. But South Africa and Namibia, uh, uh, the dispensation is the same. The issue of funding is not is, 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 is not is not part. That's why we still find Namibia and South Africa in the same situation because we agreed to fund our integrated integration in the economy ourselves, what we are not touching are the assets of, of the oppressor. That's where the issue of selling out we are trying to tease out in this discussion. Thank you very much. I think three more. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sapphire Kumar, the president of the Swazi Congress. I just have one question for the president. He spoke about the issue and the conditions that <coughs> to us. 
1994. Uh, during that phase, we should remember vividly so that the apartheid government had lost, lost credibility in the world, in the continent, in the southern region. And my question is, why did the ANC, uh, as leader of the revolution by that time, underground and overt? How did they fail to escalate a condition of a total takeover? So that they don't find themselves in a situation of compromise based on issues of policies and things that must be changed in society mm -hmm. since 1994 to this time. What led the ANC covertly and openly to escalate a condition where they were going to be able to make a total takeover? Thank you. Thank you. My question is, uh, Comrade Pardo speaks about uh, how is the lead up um, the fall of uh, uh, the new or the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union did not really impact the change or the creation of the negotiated settlement. But my question is, um, is that completely true? Was there not a difference in the, in the ideological posturing of how the Serbian constitution would have been Created and therefore the ideological posturing of how uh, the government uh, would ultimately uh, uh, operate. You know, Komenzana, when he's speaking about uh, cooking the rice inside the pot, and the part where he quotes the uh, the the, the, the Nin's document, he speaks about how they were supposed to be the pillars had to be changed for the operation of uh, what we had envisioned in the dream being implemented. So my question is. Is the change in, in, in the ideological posturing of the ANC uh, in the leader from 1972, particularly 1990, when the Soviet Union finally is said to have fallen and moving towards the constitution, have not been the selling out of an ideological posturing that would have put the working class before the, the people of profit? That's my question. I think my name is Fonse. The first question I want to ask to Comrade Parachara yes, we have not sold out, but have we betrayed the people of South Africa? Looking at the diagnostic report that was delivered by the NSG, Comrade Kwete. And maybe to also abuse the platform and ask should the South Africa condemn the operation done by Hamas, considering our path to freedom and our experience? And that uh, most of the negotiation done by Israel and, and Palestine are led by the same people who are funding. Israel in uh, the Okay. The best question is the one you care. Um, my name is Lucy Um, I think, I don't know if it's a question or if it's a comment or if it's both, but it's very difficult to disagree with someone once they give you context, right? Um, but I want to stand on the identities that I hold, which is like, number one, a young person and number two, a woman, right? And then I want to bring it into the ANC as an organization. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it outside of that. Um, my question is, what was the dream for women internally to the ANC? What was the dream then also for, for young people internally to the ANC? Because when we look at the organizational structure, um, during apartheid, you look at how we are organized now, post apartheid, you can still see that marginalization of women. Um, how far are we on the dream of a woman president? Okay. And what is the holdup? What is really, what are we, what are we struggling to grapple with in terms of that? Or was that not part of the dream? Thank you very much, Mr. Um, the questions on YouTube have also been sent to Comrade Fallo. He's aware of them and um, we allow time. Yes. <laughs> Just to get, to get uh, Comrade Fallo uh, to respond and then we we'll get uh, Comrade Mac to respond. Comrade Fallo, a few questions that have been raised. And I trust that you heard a few of them, but in summary, uh, the questions relate to, firstly, 
Make a total takeover of um uh, of the the, the 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 means of uh economy taking over the economy and ensuring that the people own uh, the economy. Another question was also around the issue of why are we still where we are now, what is the ANC doing in terms of making the lives of the people change? Yeah, woman. And also section of clarifying section 25 of the constitution. Was it crafted properly or was there something that we missed in terms of crafting the constitution, particularly on section 25? There's also a question of um, the social and the political transformation, yes, we've done well on social and, and political. However, in terms of the economy, there's still some challenges uh, when you look at um, the question of corruption and how we have not advanced better uh, from the economy. The dream is referred to as a nightmare currently. The finance of the transformation, the assets are still sitting in the hands of um, the, the, the previous uh, oppressors and the assets were not touched, why was that the case? So this in a nutshell, in terms of the questions that have been asked in terms of the economy, uh, the political questioning, the ideological change, well, there seems to be um, a different approach that was taken that did not put the workers in front. What was the reason? in terms of the, the posture, the ideological posturing of the ANC, was it not affected uh, by the change uh, from the, the influence of the, 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 the USSR? Uh, that's, that's in the nutshell, uh, uh, Comrade Palo, the questions and the discussions that ensued. Thank you, Comrade. Can you hear us, uh, Kumbi Palo? Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm in the unfortunate position that as a result of uh, the problem we've been having with the sound, I couldn't hear the questions very well and couldn't hear even your summary very well. Uh, there are, I think, a number of questions which I can address because uh, I think they revolve around uh, what we have done with the constitution rather than uh, addressing how we arrived at the constitution. Now, what we have done with the constitution, of course, uh, depends on a whole range of uh, matters. I think we have to remember, and perhaps uh, some of the audience might not be old enough to even know or recall uh, the circumstances around which we came into office in 1994. Uh, we came into office uh, in the context of uh, what was sort of, I suppose, uh, a small-scale war in some of our townships in uh, the Val, East Val especially, a uh, context of uh, mini war in KwaZulu-Natal. We came into office uh, in the context of uh, a threat by a coalition of uh, the white far right, 
uh, Lucas Mongope and others to uh, sabotage uh, the, the democratic elections that were due that year. Uh, we came into political office uh, a year after the brutal assassination of Comrade Khazani. Uh, so the threat of instability uh, at the moment we came into political office was very, 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 very real. And the immediate, the immediate challenge for the democratic government was to ensure stability. Now that meant a whole number of things. Uh, apart from the volatile political situation I've just described, there were also what we had inherited from the apartheid regime. They bankrupted the country. There was a huge debt which we had to address. And uh, that meant, of course, that you had to address that before you could even begin thinking of doing many of the things you wanted to do. Nonetheless, despite that, we did take a number of measures to try and move forward <clears throat> the program of the democratic movement. Uh, the RTP has been mentioned, and I think uh, many people uh, might feel that the RTP was abandoned. Uh, I don't think the RTP was abandoned myself, but I think that it was the implementation of the RTP that had to take a course which perhaps we had not anticipated and which had to be tempered by the realities we had to immediately face. One of the questions, for example, <coughs> uh, was uh, the place of, South Af of the South African economy in the world. And when we went into the WTO, uh, that posed its own challenges. And uh, sectors of our economy were very negatively impacted by that. But you had to do it. There was no way you could not do it. Uh, so I think we should weigh many of those factors when we talk about uh, the uh, uh, yeah yeah some of the economic issues like the RGP and some of the social abolition programs that we spoke about. And as I said, despite that, one cannot say that uh, things were the same as they were in 1993 or that they were the same in 1999 as they were in 1994. The quality of people's lives had changed and had changed quite remarkably. Now, of course, uh, one is not saying that, uh, you know, we've swept away poverty, uh, we've done away with uh, uh, many of the uh, <coughs> deficits, uh, that were left to us by the previous regime. We haven't done that. And in certain respects, uh, some of them are becoming tougher to address. But I think the comrades who said that the central problem is the fight against poverty have hit the nail on the head. And the question then becomes, what are the strategies that we need to address the question of poverty? It's easy to point fingers and say, uh, you know, uh, the dream is a nightmare. Uh, yes, uh, you might feel that way. But the question that I always ask, we were under a nightmare too, under apartheid. We did something about it. And we found a solution to it. What strategies are we discussing today to address the question of poverty? How do we address the issue of poverty? How do we wage the struggle against poverty? That refers then also to the question of, you know, the uh, comrades were talking about two nations, one rich and one poor. Uh, yeah, what was the dream for the women, what was the dream for the youth? 
I think that again is posing the question in the wrong fashion. Uh, I think uh, what we should be talking about is what have women acquired as a gender as a result of our democratic constitution? What additional rights should they acquire and should they be striving for? What additional powers and rights do they want to struggle for? Those are the questions. If you talk just about, <coughs> sorry, one area, very controversial in many parts of the world, women's reproductive rights. What was there before 1994? The word scandalous cannot even capture it. People have to go to backstreet abortionists, and I don't know what else not. Those reproductive rights now are in the hands of women in South Africa. But what's happening in places like the United States couldn't happen here. That's a very important right that we would have won. And there are many other rights that women have won, especially African women. In terms of the apartheid law, African women, <clears throat> whether two years old or 200 years old, were always minors. That's no longer the case. That's a very radical change in terms of the status of women. Now, are the other rights that women should be struggling for? Absolutely, of course. And the constitution gives them the space and the right to do that. Same thing applies to the youth. The very same things applies to the youth. The challenge then is not to say, have we fulfilled the dream? Has the ANC delivered on the dream? The challenge is, what can I do? What can we do as a society using the tools we have at our disposal to pursue the dream? Because the gates have been opened. And that is the challenge. How do we pursue the dream? There's a tendency, I think, to want to say everything must be done by government. There are certain things that government must, should, and does do. But there are other things which are not going to be done by government, but which can only be done by government in cooperation with the people. And often with the active leadership of the people themselves. Someone was telling me just recently about uh, housing projects established last century uh, in various parts of uh, Eastern Europe and how they arrived at those housing schemes, their design was they called in the communities themselves and had them discuss what sort of housing they wanted, what they wanted the houses to look like, what sort of facilities they wanted in their neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are creative ways of actively engaging the people in the transformation that is necessary. Are we doing that? That I think is the challenge. Uh, there was one of, uh, was it the land question and the ambiguities around the land question and the relevant clause in the constitution. It might surprise many people to learn that in the constitution, there isn't a word about uh, buyers and sellers. There isn't a word about willing buyers, willing sellers. Not a word about that. If we feel that that clause is not explicit enough, 
then we should agitate to have it made explicit. Then we should have a change to make it explicit. That the state shall have the power, but it's there in the constitution in any case, as far as I know. But if you want to make it more explicit, you can do that. But as it stands now, right now, I think the state does have the power to intervene with respect to the land question. I think I've covered all the questions. Thank you. There are in fact three documents that are crucial in the development of the history of our country to a democracy. The first of those is the African claims of the ANC, the document on the 16th of December 1943. It is in that African claim that the ANC unequivocally came out with a position that it wanted freedom and universal rights for all. It went beyond saying it, we just want it for the African people. It understood that the freedom of one group became to as long as all of them. So that's the African thing. I just want to say that it explicitly took the Atlantic Charter, which is formulated by the Western powers in the Second World War, and it used that as a platform to say, if that is what you are claiming, that this Second World War is a war for democracy, then let us interpret that for our position. And interpret it to mean that there should be democracy in South Africa, and that means the universal right for all, including the real right. So I'm saying this because I must be clear, there is a, a narrative in this country Sometimes even advanced by leading people in the AMC or the tripartite movement. And there's a narrative that says, you know, that there was a, this constitution was the most But I'm showing you the claims of the 1940 already had the idea of the Bill of Rights. Already had the idea of both The second document that is important is the Freedom Charter of 1955. It was not a document of a program of action, it was a document encapsulating the vision that we had for a future South Africa. And it was crafted in such a way that it had the voice of people from the ground. It was the demands of people and the vision of people written even on the back of envelopes, back of wrapping paper, 
It was taken then, collected and analyzed in order to produce the chart. And by that time, there is no other document that existed in the whole history of the country that had such legitimacy. The third document is the South African Constitution of 1993. It is important to remember, and I would advise you to, to try and go and look at a photograph of our first National Assembly, because the Constitutional Assembly was made up of the House of Assembly, 400 members, and what was that time the Senate, 190. But these were people now elected on the principle of one person, one vote. And what you see there is people of all colors, people from all classes, from domestic workers, factory workers, to mine workers, to professionals, to business people. There are Africans, overwhelming majority. And you will also see a very large presence of women. But those women came from the ranks of the ANC. There is no other document that has such legitimacy and credibility as the Constitution of 1990. It was written over a period of two years by that, those two houses combined. And if you think that there was a sellout there, then you have to take your argument further and acknowledge then that those 500 odd people were the people who did the selling out. <laughs> That is to say, you will be saying that it is the elected representatives of us, the people, who sold us out. Because this was not a white dominated group. This was a group dominated overwhelmingly by people voted in under the banner of the ANC and the banner of the ANC covered the Tripartite right Alliance. That's the voice that was there. So we need to be clear about how legitimate and credible it was. If we place that in the context, the point made by Comrade Tom, that if there is a problem, it is a problem of how we use that constitution. Now, understand one thing. As the ANC and the Alliance, we believe in the active participation of the people. Palo has emphasized how it was relevant and critical in our strategy and tactics to overthrow the party. And when we won that democracy, we won it on the basis that we would be going periodically to the people for their mandate. And that mandate for the process takes place through the elections that we hold. And if we get rejected by the people, we we'll stop blaming the people. Must look at ourselves and see what are we doing wrong. That's my way of just briefly sketching an outline. And I want to deal with the property and land clause because it's clear that well, it is one of the critical issues that is still in debate in our country. The, the suggestion is made that the formulation in the Constitution of 1996 hampers us from expropriating without compensation. There's a book written by Tembeka Lugarito. He's done an in-depth study of the land matter. There are also a number of articles, but one of them is written by Janice Duga, daughter of the late Juma. She too has studied the land question. And she looked intensively at the clause in the Constitution. In fact, as Paolo has said, that does not appear the word willing buyer, willing seller. I can say with confidence because at Cordessa, the regime did try, and the supporters of perpetuating white domination tried desperately to put in market-related, willing buyer, willing seller. And we rejected it. And it did not get it. But what Mukaitobi is saying 
is that he has found evidence that subsequently, and I cannot remember exactly what year, that a cabinet memo introduced the word willing buyer, willing seller. So that's the status of it. It has no status as a proper law. I would therefore suggest that as a school, or the town school, we should always be pursuing our discussions on the basis of facts. And if you look at those facts, you will see that we changed the argument that was there in the Freedom Charter. I know we all claim that we must follow the Freedom Charter to the T, but how come on the land question we don't follow it and we don't raise a word? Because the Freedom Charter has a completely different statement on the land question. And it says, the land shall be shared amongst those who work it. Emphasis, those who work it. Restriction of land ownership on a racial basis shall be ended, and all land redivided amongst those who work it to banish famine and hunger. And the state shall help the peasants with implements, seeds, tractors, and dams to save the soil and assist the dealers. But we changed it now. We changed it. We said all those who were dispossessed. Our constitution said that we'll start from 1913, land there. And from within our own ranks, letting people say, no, no, it must not go to 1652. And they know that in order to trace it to 1652, you will have no records except the records of the white man and the colonizer to argue. So, it was very important that what was being expressed from the ground of our people was to deal with the question of hunger and that the land should be used to produce products. And therefore, the emphasis was it shall be distributed to those who tell them. But that's a separate argument again. Because Comrade Palawan said, we must look at our strategy and tactics as nothing growing, developing, evolving. And that is shaped by the circumstances under which we live in the world. So that much for the property clause. I urge people, uh, I am quite willing to give you the references to go to the I told his book. In fact, I would suggest one of the things that the old Tamba school should do is to invite Lukai Tobi and invite Jackie Juba to come and lead a discussion here. And I would suggest you put in that panel somebody who's claiming that the land, that the clause of the constitution is not safe, is, is useless. Let's have that debate. And let's just be informed about the way you go. I would encourage that approach on this type of question. Now, probably. We got used to using the word that uh, the Constitution did not provide for the economic transformation of our country. There is nothing in our Constitution that prevents us from getting the votes for the people, going into Parliament, making laws, and being the government as the executive, implementing those laws to bring those changes. The question is how and what changes do we make? We'll answer that partly again by urging you to look at matters in history as something that is evolving, evolving, and must be looked at in terms of the facts that were known at that time. So that we learn to look at our history against the background that colonialism tried in Southern Africa in particular to rob of our people of a sense of self-esteem, to deny us a past. That's why our history book started in 1652, as if there was no other past in our country. It is important, therefore, that we look at this question and bear in mind again that the ANC set up the Constitutional Committee 
on the 8th of January 1986. It was set up as a process where President Tambo turned to Comrade Palo and said, Palo, who was heading the research and information and publicity, said there are all sorts of proposals being made inside South Africa. Can you look at those proposals and give us a paper that analyzes them? He did that in that paper, but he ended up by saying that these are all coming from the regime or in the interest of preserving white power. What we need is that the ANC must lead the discussion. And to do that, he suggested we should commit ourselves publicly to a Bill of Rights. And secondly, that we should commit ourselves to multi-party democracy. That was announced by the ANC in the January 8th statement, 1987, by President Trump. But on his suggestion then shifted our posture, because he said, if you want to lead the debate and lead the processes, you must put forward the ideas and let others react to you. That's part of leadership. But as you engage in that reaction and debate, as a leading force, you must be prepared to accommodate when facts show different answers from what you believe. You should never be afraid of that. So, as a result of that process, there came up the constitutional guidelines that were made public in August 1988. Then let me emphasize this. Constitutional guidelines developed by the ANC Constitutional Committee, adopted by the Working Committee and the NEC as guidelines, and published for discussion in 1988, August. This is before 1990, before the release of Mandela, even before the release of what is the Zulu and Kamban. Now, but before finalizing that for discussion, the ANC called a meeting in Zambia, the University of Zambia, and it called all members of the NEC, except myself, because I was now pretending that I'm dying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they called together the chief representatives from around the world, the heads of departments, sections, delegates from the military camps, departmental heads, education, health, arts and culture, religious affairs, radio freedom, the uh, extra international coordinating committee, the departments of political education and manpower, department of information and publicity, the political military council, military headquarters, national intelligence of ANC, SACP. Several reasons, but immediately to take office on the debate. Freedom Charter says nationalization of British, various instruments, etc. At that conference at the University of Zambia, Comrade Tabo Mbeki led a discussion, followed by Comrade Max Sisulu, head of the economics department of the AAC. And Comrade raised a very interesting problem. He said, he challenged that conference about the easy solutions used using notions, easy notions of nationalization and control of the economy. He gave examples to the conference of issues raised by Fidel Castro with Tambo, of issues raised by Gorbachev with Tambo about the question of the economy. And in raising that, he went on to say, the Freedom Charter correctly demands that the wealth of the country shall be restored to the people. But he says, to conference, but how was that? How was the ANC to govern them on that basis? To restore wealth to the people? How was he going to do that when it's in power? 
and he reminded us how would the AC be able to harness the intellectual and scientific resources needs, needed to manage last, large sectors of the economy? So these were questions that he posed to that conference. And it was followed by Max also. Because what we were doing is we were looking at the experiences of all the countries around the world that we saw as progressive. And you see how far they went. And what are they achieving and what mistakes are happening? And we realized already at that time with the questions he was posing that managing this economy would be a, a huge difficult task. And that taking just blueprint answers without the facts in front of you would be highly problematic. So I thought I'd remind you of that. But I'd remind ourselves of one more thing that arose in that country. Because I hear in the ranks of our movement some voices which turn around and say, you know, this constitution, we don't want it to. How can the constitutional court be the one that decides whether a law is, is constitutional or not? It is at that conference of 1988, March, that Comrade Tony O'Dowd, who at that time living in London and could not make it to the conference, submitted the paper at the invitation of the conference professor. Antonio Dawood then raised the question, looking at the experience of the world and the movement, and he's, he's, he was asked to present a discussion on the legal system and the judiciary. And he put the question to conference. He says, the most difficult question in constitutional law was whether the highest lawmaking authority, which is our parliament, should subject itself to the law. He said he believed that South Africa should consider the need for creating a separate constitutional court to serve as an impartial authority to decide if the Constitution's Bill of Rights are being observed. That was from our own ranks. But what was important, he was saying that that court would look at whether the government of the ANC is observing the Bill of Rights. And what we have got in our Constitution's Bill of Rights today are the rights that guarantee you your rights as an individual. So that is how the Constitutional Court arises. There are lots of twists and turns how it ends up in the way we formulate it. But the root of the idea is March 1988 <coughs> in Osaka and the conference of the 250 delegates. And there were vigorous debates. Father was there. He had a discussion too. And we can tell you to that to make it a living bit. Perhaps someday you should call Andre Udendorf, who's written a book called Dear Comrade President. And he's intensively studied details of the work of the Constitutional Committee from 1986 to 1990, uh, in fact, 1994. So you should call him to give you that picture so that you can see how these positions arose out of debate within our movement. <laughs> I have emphasized that present at that conference in March 1988 was also the SACP and SACTU. But it goes beyond that. The Communist Party Central Committee had set up a constitutional committee also. And it has been looking at that way. And inputs were made. Both in the preparation as the constitutional committee worked, we went down the line. I can tell you an anecdote. The constitutional committee was still debating whether we believed in multi party democracy. And they were tossing around ideas. This was still long before the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Our dream was hey, democracy. What is in Britain is a bourgeois democracy. What we want is a people's democracy, like in Hungary and Romania and East Germany. But 
all oh, I'm sent to the Constitutional Committee, comrades, I want to know from you. Do you support multi-party democracy? And as they hesitated giving answers, he turned around and said, Comrade, if we want to win this battle of ideas, and we want to win it, <coughs> democracy in South Africa, we have to commit ourselves to multi-party democracy. And that's why the Bill of Rights contains the rights of anybody to form a political party, assembly, association, and advance the Why should we be afraid of it? That's a question that Amrit Palo asked when he presented his paper, The New Face of the Counter Revolution. He said, We are the last to be afraid of that debate with the people. Because we know. That in the debate where we talk to our people and deal with their problems, we're the ones that are committed to defining the solutions. If the solutions take a long time come, let's put the facts on the table to the public so they understand what problem we are facing. So that's insofar as the constitutional guidelines. I dwelt on it because it was a document made public in August 1988. It was used for consultations inside the country. With the, inside the country, there were discussions going on, taken up by the UDF, taken up by the trade unions. It was discussed abroad. Academics in the country discussed it. Academics abroad discussed it. <coughs> and again, it was very important to the guidelines. It didn't say this is the constitution, because it was a guideline to say. Constitution that will come up in our country will be a constitution written by the elected delegates of the country. So that's where we were. Now, it's in that context that I want to respond to the question that has been raised really by Congress Phoebe about the economic strategy. It's beyond the economic transformation. The economic transformation is important, but so is the social transformation of our country. Our children are still bust around. Yes, we've opened the schools to all races, but we have to bust our children. And then when they go to that school, the, oh yes, they've got a mixed group of kids in there. But the school is uh, the, the bell rings for dismissal. The kids who come from a privileged background go into the playground to play and, and other activities. But the kids are from, the, from the townships are put into the buses and back to the township. They don't have a chance to integrate and talk to each other and understand each other and work together. So, the transformation of our country is still a huge problem. And you raise the question why didn't we provide for the finance? There was no finance. There was no country that we could turn around to say, as said in Lancaster House, Britain, you were the ruling power, you pay. Let's avoid that. Let's understand the place in which the problems arise. And let's understand, therefore, how that things have to be managed. Now, questions have arisen and reference has been made to the RTB. The RTB was developed by us correctly with a vision led by the mass democratic movement. But it was without data. The data that we saw when we got into government in 1994 began to flesh out the problem that we faced. Now, you may debate, and you are free to debate, and should debate, whether then here was the right answer. But then, before you shake your head, the data show that the economy grew for the next 15 years. It is in the last 15 years that our economy has stopped growing. Yeah, it was 1996 or 8. I'm part of the criminal, but I'm part of cabinet at that time. But that was here at that time. It is against that year and against the RDP, there was the growth in the economy for the first 15 years. And those first 15 years were dominated by you. So, again, I'm saying, 
You must debate these matters amongst each other. You are in advanced school, you must dig in the facts to bring it into the debate. But not for the purpose of just debating, but for the purpose of finding answers of how we move forward. <coughs> Therefore, Comrade, while I haven't dealt with all your questions in time, I want to conclude in a different way. I want to conclude in what makes a person into a leader. I think that in social development and change, there is always a need for an organization to mobilize the people. So you decide on a campaign. We decided in, in the 50s against the revolution of Sophia Tau, we shall not move. And we even put the slogan over our dead bodies. When the removal took place, we couldn't do anything. We had put the wrong slogan. <laughs> <laughs> but the ANC has written about it and talked about those things and saying this was we did this under these circumstances and we were wrong, we didn't realize that. So it is prepared to admit that. But I say that when people take that decision and the consequences are not what you planned. And usually in history and social development. <coughs> Every campaign, the consequence is not exactly what you plan. Quite often it's a mess. Ask me, I've been in jail many times. But at that moment when it's a mess, there will be the comrade who will turn around and say, you know, when we debated this matter, I told you all, I didn't agree with you. <laughs> Forget about it. Out, not a leader. We're not going to leader. The other one will say, no, I did not vote with that decision. And I thought it was done the No, out. The one who becomes the leader is the one who says, okay, this is where we are now. I take responsibility for it and find an answer how to go forward. That's what makes a leader. So when you're debating this question against the Constitution of 1996, and you're mixing it with the question of what have we done to make change our country, not because the Constitution is wrong, but because we have failed the Constitution. So, when we are debating that question, don't debate it just as an academic exercise. Debate it as an exercise that says, okay, I take responsibility. What is the way forward? Let's present a way forward. And when you do that, in finding a mass movement, you will have to agree with the majority view. And when things go wrong again, don't say I was opposed to that view. Let's say I take responsibility. So, comrades, I think that what has happened between 1994 and now, the slow pace of change, the mistakes we've made, the corruption, the abuse of power. That's yesterday I'm reading, I'm coming here on the internet. There's an ex now in. in one of, the, the, one of the local municipalities has, has an accident, kills a motorcyclist. The car that he was driving had a blue light. He had his security in charge of it. And it turns out that the car is not a government car. It's a private car that's got a blue light. That's abuse of power. That's abuse. So abuse informs small to big things. And I think one of the problems we have with our country we still don't have a law that has said that the abuse of power is a criminal offence, challenging a child of his own. Would it be supposed to give you me, you be the leaders of tomorrow, some of you will abuse the power and you will not be jail. <laughs> <laughs> Why, 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 why not total takeover? 
<laughs> you know, comrades, I come from a generation where I had responsibility for sending the at home. And I regarded that as a duty that I would also get home. I don't want to say how many comrades, how many comrades when they were ordered to go home, how many turned up on that day with bandages on their ankles to say they can't walk and they can't walk. The idea of a takeover is a very easy concept. Uh, I, I was part of the group in 1961 that sang the song, and I can't sing them. <laughs> a piece of dynamite will take the country to cast away. Six <coughs> one time will have taken over the country. It did not understand that number one, there was no neighboring country that would give us a safe beer base. Our headquarters for a long time were in first in Dar es Salaam, Morocco, Congo, and then Lusaka. But to get to South Africa, you had to pass through Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, Swaziland. Secondly, we had no idea of just how strong the enemy was. It was one of the most professional armies, equipped with the best equipment, equipped with the Air Force. And every time we tried to set up a base inside the country, we started with the Chinese model to set up the base in the countryside. We did, but wiped out in three months. We tried then to say, well, the people are our ocean. So we'll set up bases in the urban area. <coughs> we had G5, it was called Shoni Shoke or Shinju Nyanda. Talk about it. Or Asikata was now in the Integrity Commission. We began to live in the mine dumps as our hideout. That's how the child, line of child was about you. Because they traced him and he fought to the end and he died in the house in Sewell. Because every time we tried to set up a base, once the enemy smelt a whiff of it, they mobilized their entire force, air force, mechanized force, etc., and they were down on you. <coughs> without an internal base, without a rear base, the idea of a guerrilla war taking over was a lingering debate. And it was not, <coughs> not that we failed to make efforts. We went, we sent comrades to fight in what was called Wonky and Tikurela, but I call it Wonky, because that's what the Zimbabwe is now called Wonky. Got wiped out. We tried to send comrades through Mozambique, from Tanzania. One of them is still around, I think, just like Jela, he's now in his 90s. That mission to fail. We tried to send people by boat to the Aventura. Colonel Mbani is still alive, the commander of that. Uh, Chiro, Chiro, still alive, he's in his 90s. I visited him the other day, part of Aventura. So it's not for the failure of tribe. But we understood one thing that in prosecuting the armed struggle, we wanted to do it in a way that avoids the racial wars. But once you open that tap, you find it very difficult to close it. Just look at the Rwanda, what happened in Rwanda. Mm. So, the idea of a takeover was a dream that we still pursued. Because it's a, it accorded with the one thing that we had reached a point where we either submit or we die. And we prepared to fight and die. But, as Paul said, well, to constantly analyze what is happening in order to find a way forward. You cannot just follow the blueprint mechanical. And when we looked at the situation as it was developing, we realized that the possibility of negotiations have arisen. Chambo had great reservations. But the credit that he has to have is that we were conducting the struggles in silos, underground, mass struggle, international mobilization, armed activity in separate silos. 
he managed it all to make sure that they complemented each other. And he managed even the processes that were leading up to negotiations. So that's where we were. We were realists, we took into account the changes that were happening, and we went into negotiations knowing that still we needed the people behind it. And if you look at what we did in 1990 to 94, there were periods where we had rolling mass action. So the participation of the people is the key issue. The lesson that you should be taking <coughs> is how do you, as activists in the struggle, become organizers in the struggle? Each one of us, as members of the movement, should be an organizer bringing in new people into our ranks. And the debate that should take place is not just with the young people, it should be with the older people. And I'll conclude by saying, Andre Odendahl in his book, Father in my book, deals with 1985 and what happened behind the scenes. Andre looks in detail at the Constitutional Committee. <coughs> and he shows how the narrative of how the changes happen is based on really what the public intelligence people were and what British conservatives. In film, endgame, books, Willie Esther Hazer, who was had in the talks at Mills Park, was working for the NIS, was paid by them, codenamed Fat. That's come up since then. But his version stands as a story of our Virginia, and we buy into it. So Andre Odendahl concludes, green shoots of the story that should be told is being told now. Petru and Dear Conway President are two vital books in that. And of course, thank you very much to the All of the Double School for making that part of the display. Challenges us to go back to seeking knowledge and facts. Taking us back to reflect on the major and significant documents that guide our revolution. We need not blame the Constitution, we need to blame ourselves for our inactivity and taking the issues forward. And the books by Kumrit Mek and Kumrit Arpano, and the book by um, Andre Olena, one is Breakthrough, the other one is Dear Mr. President, are some of the literature that can help us understand the issues for where we are now and where we come from. And as I said when I opened India, I said, this environment, this venue, is a venue where we need we need enlightenment, we need more knowledge, and this public lecture is not disappointing. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay. on. Yeah, Pala, <coughs> just 60 seconds for your party short, please. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes. <laughs> no, I don't think I have anything to add. Uh, one of my problems, of course, being uh, the sound issue that was bothersome. But um, I think we have covered the issues. And uh, yeah. I want to thank the school for giving us this opportunity.
Come in, Paolo. Please unmute. Try to unmute again. We could not hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. now we can hear you. Please, we give you the, the, the 60 seconds again. Yes, I was saying thank you to the school for the opportunity, but I don't think I have anything else to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to ask uh, our board member, Kida Pidi-Dokida, to give a uh, vote of thanks. Good evening at the end of the night. and uh, mine is a very easy task. Um, firstly to the FES for giving the venue um, and making it available to us. I think that the, the partnership between the OA Public School and the FES is a long-standing partnership. Um, and we're always uh, grateful for that cooperation. Um, thank you very much to Comrade pa Paolo and Comrade Matt Maharaj for um, the willingness to engage and to share their experiences. But I think to also reflect the intellectual vigor in the movement that there shouldn't be a question that's too difficult to ask and a question too difficult to respond to. Uh, because at the end of the day, what it is about is finding answers to creating a better society and a better life for, for all our people. And that is why we must be relentless about asking the questions, but also finding answers to the, to the question. To the Oa Tambo school staff, thank you very much, uh, led by the principal. I don't know whether Comrade Passondo is still here. Um, and um, the COO, thank you very much for, for um, organizing this event. I think that the public lectures are an important part of raising the debate, but also um, learning from each other across different generations. Uh, the caterers, uh, you're going to have yummy food after this. Um, our special guests um, <coughs> and all of the participants here tonight. And I just wanted to say that I'm really encouraged that the demographic in the room is so young. Um, um, I think it's a, it's a sign that, that you are interested in political education, that you are interested in politics. And I think that that is a really encouraging sign uh, that we have a generation, new generation of activists that want to know the answers to the, to the challenges that we face today. And as Comrade Mack and Comrade Paolo said that um, the purpose of understanding and asking questions and listening and learning is not just simply to become clever, but it is to be able to, to make those changes, to become organizers, to become activists. Um, and I think that as we, we move towards 2024, we need to make sure that the African National Congress remains the organization that has the aspirations of our people, the dream of our people. And the only way that we can do that is if all of us play our role to make sure that we define that dream. Um, because strategy and tactics, as the comrades say, is not static. To define the dream, but then to look at what do we need to do today and tomorrow and the day after to be able to make that dream a reality. And all of us taking responsibility for working for that dream. Amanda. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, for your participation and your contribution to the discussion. And this is not the end of it. There will be more of the lectures. Please follow the school on all the socials. Uh, send us the emails for inquiries and also suggestions of what you like to see and what you like to debate on and discuss on. Your contributions are also you know, enhancing. Uh, thank you very much. We will see you at the next next party's lecture. And there is a stall out there for books. You can buy books. Uh, hopefully, your book is there. You know, we don't know. Uh, also, 
the food uh, court is open, please go and enjoy yourselves and let the discussion flow as we are eating and the question is asked and, and answered. I think someone who's driving a Lexus Z driving a please your fat baby. Can the case open for me? Are you not going to have someone to eat? Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank